A basic understanding of economics may be the final barrier separating us from the kind of world we wish to have, simply because a just economy can truly be equivalent to a just society. This program is an attempt to popularize, to some extent, the notion of economics. The Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform believes that it is necessary to do so, so that those who make policy have benchmarks for distinguishing, if you will, compromise from surrender. It is the object of this program to provide just such a benchmark. To that end, we begin with an analogy. The automobile is a system consisting of a number of subsystems, which include an engine, an electrical subsystem, a transmission, axles, a suspension subsystem, and brakes, to name a few. Anyone who owns a car knows that all of the subsystems of a car must be functioning properly and in relation to each other. No single subsystem has priority over any other. For example, it would be dangerous to have all of the subsystems running well, with the exception of the brakes. Or, if there is a problem with the transmission, the car may run poorly. Oh, and there's one other thing a car needs in order to fulfill its function. A driver, someone who steers the vehicle, knows when to apply the brakes, buy gas, and change the oil. Well, to some extent, the same holds true for our economy. The economy also is a system which consists of the following main subsystems. The environment, the public sector, the private sector, and the personal sector. Here too, all of the subsystems have to function more or less properly and in relation to each other. Now, our analogy is not exact since the car is simply a mechanical device, whereas our economic system is more flexible. But you get the idea. For example, if we disregard the environment, we do so at our peril. Or, if we consider one subsystem to be more important than any other, well, we're looking for trouble, and as we shall see, that is exactly what we found. Oh, and as is the case with our car, there's one other thing we need to make our economy function. Policy directives. Policy determines how the economy should be managed, which subsystems need tending to, and what options need to be developed. But this isn't happening because over the last 35 years, our policymakers have not only allowed the market subsystem to top the list, but that subsystem has been treated as if it were the only one. The market subsystem has become, by default, the economic system. Now, this has been a terrible policy error, resulting in untold environmental, social, and personal chaos. To refer to our automotive analogy, it is as if there were someone driving a car which didn't know where he was going, was unaware of the car's subsystems, and knew nothing about maintenance. In a word, someone driving who basically knew very little about driving. The vehicle, you could say, is out of control. Now, you may say that in relation to our economy, well, things just can't be that bad. As you move through our program, you may draw your own conclusions. From its beginnings, economics has been a hybrid, a mix of a stab at science and just plain lobbying. Recently, I was at a lecture where the speaker, a man well-versed in economic matters, stated that after hundreds of years, we still do not have a workable economic theory. So where do we begin? Well, since the market subsystem overrides all else, let us take a look at it. Until about a century ago, most thinking on economic matters was being done in terms of labor theories of value, one of which noted that the amount of labor that entered into the production of a commodity was seen as the determinant of its value. 
Labor theories of value replaced earlier theories, such as that of the mercantilists, who considered precious metals as the supreme value, or the physiocrats who thought that agriculture was the only really productive pursuit, and attributed to it almost mystical properties. The trouble with labor theories of value, if you want to call it trouble, was that they brought the key relationships of the capitalist economy into too glaring a focus, which is to say social-minded writers were finding in them proof of labor's exploitation. To mask this troubling truth, marginal, or if you like, market theory, still in vogue today, made its appearance. Market theory shifted the discussion of value from production to the market. And in the marketplace, price and income distribution were explained in terms of an impersonal, almost mystical guidance by the so-called invisible hand of market forces. Value was simply where supply met demand and the market was cleared. Couched in differential equations, the argument appeared to be scientific, beyond questioning. The social question of labor exploitation was thus done away with, or more precisely, repressed. But it all rested on a misunderstanding. The new theory undertook to deduce conclusions about the real world from mathematics, instead of by mathematics from relevant social data. And being a mathematical model, it neatly excludes the fact that people do not always act in rational, just, and equitable ways in their dealings with one another. Market theory got the world into grave trouble in the 30s and stubbornly remains at the core of our difficulties today. Perhaps the most outstanding characteristic of the market subsystem is the notion that it will naturally balance itself out because if there is too much demand, prices will rise. And if there's too much supply, then prices will drop. Assuming this to be so, market economists then maintain that there should be no government interference in the workings of the marketplace, that little or no direction or regulation is necessary. The model is a mathematically balanced pseudo-scientific hypothesis which has the added feature of being easy to understand. But does it work? Well, any market imperfections must be omitted as they would invalidate its rationale. And similarly, the impact upon price of other subsystems must be ruled out for the same reason. It is as if we had a car which wouldn't move when we put it into gear, but because the engine was running, we declared it to be functional. Clearly, our economy is more complex than this laissez-faire or neoclassical model would suggest. But it does serve as a starting point, and we will build on it in our next section. John Maynard Keynes, the most influential economist of the 20th century, demonstrated that prices cannot successfully coordinate varying intentions with varying time scales so that the outcome is always optimal. That is why markets produce monopoly, instability, underemployment, underinvestment, and inequality, and why it is imperative that the government does act to lean against those trends using a full array of macroeconomic and regulatory policies. The Keynesian subsystem can be expressed as follows. An increase in aggregate demand leads to an increase in aggregate supply. An increase in aggregate supply brings on a further increase in aggregate demand, and so forth. The effect may also snowball in the other direction. A decline in demand shrinks production, which further reduces demand, leading to a further curtailment of production, and so on. When we combine this Keynesian model with the free market model, the self-balancing tendencies of the latter is compromised by the divergent tendencies of the Keynesian subsystem. The logic of the whole then is not self-regulating, but demands policy management.
and so the need for government intervention. The post-war era developed problems that neither Keynes nor many of his contemporaries had foreseen. The public sector took on rapidly expanding importance within the economy, as did environmental concerns. Keynes had a broad vision of the functioning of capitalist economies, rare among economists today. For him, economics was a moral science to be used as a means to the end of making the world a more civilized place in which to live. Keynes demonstrated that the free market cannot of itself guarantee stability, and so the state must play a role in the economic affairs of the nation. But the pure and perfect concept of market economics was to resurface, and the lessons learned in the first half of the 20th century, through the raw experience of the war years and the Great Depression, along with the solutions offered by Keynes, were abandoned. Rather than accepting structural price rise as a part of the price tag for public services, increased public services per se have come to be regarded as the problem. Health, educational, and other budgets are being slashed as irresponsibly today as they were, in our opinion, rightfully expanded during the 1960s and 70s. Useful programs in which much investment was made have been abandoned. We ask economists and academics to consider the notion of a structural price rise, due not to market forces, but as necessary for the healthy development of our public sector subsystem, which we will now consider. We noted in our introduction that our economy is comprised of several subsystems. Primary among these is the public sector subsystem. It is here where the struggle for an equitable economic system occurs. This is the most important section of our program because fundamental to the development of a workable economic theory is a clear understanding that the growth of the public sector must be taken as a central issue. It is around it that any really relevant theory will have to be built. To understand why this is so, it's necessary to backtrack a bit. At the end of the 1930s, many national economies were still reeling from the lingering effects of the Great Depression. Keynes realized that solutions to creating more equitable and hence more stable national economies centered around a vibrant and growing public sector. What exactly do we mean by the public sector? When we refer to it, we are referring to unpriced services offered to the public, which are funded through our tax dollars. Services such as health care, education, social services, environmental protection, the armed forces, and infrastructure development. It is important to understand that public sector services require an additional layer of taxation over and above that calculated on the basis of the market subsystem. Thus, a given society, Finland for example, may agree through the political process to higher taxes in return for public services which are of benefit to everyone. Children, those living in poverty, the unemployed, those in poor health, the elderly, as well as those working in the market sector. The changing proportion of the public to the private sector has injected a structural component into price that conventional market theory has ignored. It's been ignored because for market theory, as we have seen, price is only a single legitimate determinant, the balancing of demand and supply. Ignoring public infrastructures and the services they render has resulted in a double counting of public services in the gross domestic product. Once as government expenditures and again in the taxation paid by private individuals and firms. Rather than ignoring it, if we take as our point of departure 
the changing proportions of the public and private sectors, we come up with an altogether different view. As has been explained, the output of the public sector is delivered according to non-market redistributional principles, but is paid for by imposts upon the private sector and its factors. The stratum of this taxation in price, which Kummer calls the social lien, answers to a logic of its own rather than to that of the market subsystem. The social lien quotient has been ignored by economists of all faiths when not denounced as the cause of runaway inflation. It is in fact the lost chord of economic theory. An analogy provided by Harvey Wilmoth of the University of Wisconsin might be helpful. Suppose a free $100 bicycle is offered as a bonus with each purchase of a $400 television set. How should such a transaction be measured for national output purposes? Did a $400 joint purchase take place or did the buyer receive a free bicycle worth $100 plus a $400 TV? Most observers would agree that a joint purchase took place at a total price of $400 and that the amount should be allocated appropriately to each item. But if you were to ignore the value of the bike you got free with the TV and attributed the entire $400 to the cost of the TV you previously had been able to buy for $300, you would conclude that there had been a 33% inflation. Something of that sort has happened by the government ignoring the effect on price of unpriced public services. This has had truly tragic consequences for social systems worldwide. To develop and implement an economic theory which correctly analyzes and situates the public sector would have revolutionary global implications. It would change the world radically for the better. A paradigm shift in policy directives would occur away from resource privatization towards shared global equity. The public sector subsystem can be illustrated in operation as follows. We suggest you consider replaying this section if it is not clear before moving on to the next section. T equals the aggregate quantum of taxation as an indicator for the size of the public sector. G equals the GNP, the gross national product. T over G equals the structural quotient. Now, the causal circuit of the social lien subsystem appears as two positive half loops, T to P and back again, P to T. Higher prices resulting from an increased T will f tend to feed back into T positively through the higher prices of goods and salaries paid for by the state. On the other hand, the same higher prices will tend to stimulate investment and thus enlarge the denominator of the crucial TG ratio. The effect of this will be partially to restore the TG ratio. This TG ratio, which Kummer determines as the structural quotient, is really an indicator for the relative magnitudes of the public sector to the entire economy. The structural quotient, though one of the most readily available and critical of statistics, was until very recently ignored by most economists. By mistaking any price increase per se as a sign of excess demand, that is, by sticking stubbornly to outdated market theory, governments have repeatedly tried to lick inflation by deflating the economy. But a throttling of G through deflationary policy hastens the growth of the TG ratio by decreasing its denominator. Note the minus indicators in our illustration. And a deflated economy gives rise to added demand for social services at the very time that it reduces the tax base. The structural quotient is thus driven up in a non-linear way. As to the policy shunt, policymakers are those who, for the most part, have the leverage to monitor 
modify, and direct these indicators. It is unfortunate, but economic decisions, as we observe them in action today, take on patterns that cannot be related to much of anything in current economic textbooks. Another key reason why Kummer decided to make this video. Since the mid-20th century, a complicated economic circuitry has come into being and calls for decoding. It is important to understand that ignoring such factors and instead calling for small government and lower taxes just changes the nature of public spending. Thus, more overcrowded jails will be built instead of schools or hospitals. Military forces will be expected to deal with more incidents of civil unrest on all continents as social systems fail due primarily to economic myopia. The personal services industry is an important subsystem of our economy. We define these as personal services to emphasize the high degree of human capital that goes into their production as distinct from capital intensive services, rentals, for example, or transportation services. The personal services quotient is defined as the proportion of personal services in the national output. The substantial growth of this ratio feeds a positive input into price. If that goes unrecognized, mistaken policy through deflationary stabilization measures will result in the need for even greater social and governmental services. And the positive feedback loop to the personal services quotient will not occur. In the long term, the personal services industry is likely to continue to be a high growth area of our economies as it does not involve the use of non-renewable resources. Between 1947 and 1968, personal, professional and business services increased by 135 percent and government services by 40 percent. From 1968 to 1980, 117 percent and 42 percent. The rapid development of computer and information technology from 1980 to 2000 has further added to these growth rates. There is one subsystem that has undisputed primacy in the hierarchy of subsystems. Whatever the laws or economies of societies may be, they are still subject to the laws of physics. As is the case with the other subsystems, the environmental subsystem too sends important information to the economy through price changes. The exhaustion of non-renewable resources will feed a negative input into price. The smaller the amount of the available resources, the higher their price will tend to become. On the other hand, environmental conservation would feed a positive component into price, supply and demand and so counter negative trends. As we move through our program, we see that economic subsystems contribute to a price gradient. If we were to set ourselves price stability as a priority, we should be depriving society of all choice concerning quality of life. After a certain point of economic development, it is personal services rather than commodity production that determine the quality of our existence. Yet, as we have seen, Governments persistently ignore the interplay of our mixed economy by valorizing the market sector alone. Let us be clear. The only way in which price can be kept stable would be through an all but exponential rate of expansion in our mass production commodity sector, such that its effects on price would balance the upward price pressures generated by the other subsystems. Such a path that is, the one we are currently following, is not even open to us. It is entirely ruled out by our ecological and resources subsystem. Last but hardly least, we will consider the household subsystem. 
When a government supplies child care and other family services for mothers who work outside the home, such investment represents not only an increase in well-being and security, but in employment, aggregate supply, and demand. Today, it takes two family heads working outside the home to provide the budget for working class and many middle class families. This constitutes a diversion of needed resources from household economies. Restoring the conditions that allowed one wage earner to support a family while the wife looked after the family's needs at home, if she chose to, would represent economic growth, which must not be confused with maximizing shareholder value. And we talk of the continued growth of individuals after they have completed physical growth. Indeed, growth really begins to gain momentum at that point in an intellectual and moral sense. Surely it is this sort of growth, apart from the growth of the gross domestic product and the development of compassionate, caring values, apart from shareholder values, which we, as a society, strive for. The maximizing of shareholder value to the exclusion of all else can go on only by the continued ravaging of all of the non-market subsystems of our economy. By way of summary, let us view, as a whole, the economic subsystems we have discussed. As we have seen, maximizing shareholder values is not the only form or definition of growth. Allowing shareholder values to override or ignore growth in our public sector, environment, household, or other subsystems of our economy reflects not only confusion, but court's disaster. It is as if we had a mix of apples, knives, and information, and called them all apples. But it is not possible to eat knives or to cut a steak with an apple. Unless policymakers understand the nature of our mixed economy and act on that understanding, the finest economic theory in the world will be as useless as a car would be without a driver. We will now consider the market subsystem from another perspective, which is to say, who benefits from keeping this unworkable model in place? The dominant revenue concept put forward by the late French economist Francois Peru is helpful, as it gives us a tool, a lens, through which we may view the language of economics in operation. According to Peru, during a specific period of development, the dominant revenue is that one to which the others adapt themselves. It is presented as the revenue that, by the rate and mass which it achieves, determines whether the given economy functions properly. In the institutional framework corresponding to the given dominant revenue, that is, in fact, the case. But in another context, it would be otherwise. To put it another way, in every historical period, the revenue of a specific interest group, the group in power, 
is taken as the barometer of the well-being of the population as a whole. This barometer is, of course, not necessarily accurate. It is important to grasp this simple but compelling proposition. In fact, this brings us to the core of our program. Conventional economic theory today is the story of our economy told in terms of profit as the dominant revenue. But this cannot be because an unrelenting price gradient reflects the fact that ours has become a mixed economy. Peru also noted that each dominant revenue period was associated with a distinct economic theory. Let's see how this works. As we have already noted, the era of merchant capitalism had as its doctrine mercantilism, concerned prim primarily with the net flow of precious metals. In terms of dominant revenue theory, mercantilism closely resembles monetarism, which rules that the money supply alone determines the price level and just about everything else. Monetarism was in vogue from the early 1970s into the 1990s. A pioneering industrial capitalism favored laissez-faire economics, which held that economic systems function best when there is no interference from government. This theory continues to be an integral part of dominant revenue rhetoric today. Advanced industrial capitalism required the market theory of value we have been considering, or more specifically, marginal utility theory, as the dominant revenue economic framework. Profits gleaned from financial speculation, essentially gambling, made possible by deregulation and globalization, has been the dominant revenue for the last decade. We shall say more about this later on in our program. The point is these economic theories move to legitimize the activities, questionable or otherwise, of the dominant revenue group. It is not possible for policymakers to assess the viability of any economic theory while ignoring the bias of the ruling group built into it, according to the dominant revenue view. As an example, we will next consider the issue of capital budgeting. In many government operations, we see the almost studious avoidance of deploying capital budgeting, also called accrual accountancy, even though to do so would go a long way towards healthy economic transparency. Writing off proportions of capital expenditures over a number of years gives a far more realistic picture of the government's books than writing a capital asset off entirely in the same year in which it was acquired, as is, to a great extent, the current practice. It is as if you bought a house through a mortgage and then, really without having the funds available, attempted to pay it off the year you bought it. Unlike household economies, such outrageous government expenditures can in fact be made in a single year, but only by adding a layer of taxation through, you guessed it, price. Such foolishness serves a purpose for dominant revenue stakeholders, for it will give our market devotees ammunition to once again claim that, to avoid the inflation such a price rise might cause, interest rates must rise. And high interest rates benefit those in a dominant revenue position. So here again, the reality of our mixed economy is foregone. We will look briefly at the dominant revenue rationale behind the non-recognition of capital in the public sector. If the entire write-off of a public investment is not covered by taxation, the absence of capital budgeting will show an exaggerated deficit and a higher debt than is warranted. The conclusion drawn? Privatization would be more efficient than public ownership. The false deficit and higher debt figures will be taken as grounds for withholding federal services 
vital for the well-being of society and the economy. The misrepresentation of net debt by the government through ignoring its physical investments has served as a pretext for slashing grants to the provinces, causing them to cut their support of municipal and other services. The absence of capital budgeting leads to a pillaging of the public sector. Undepreciated public investments listed in the government's book at a token value are invitations to privatize them to, quote, help reduce the debt. The record of such privatizations in the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, and their rapid resale at many times their purchase price shortly after, is proof positive of dominant revenue players in action. In Canada, the Auditors General, on more than one occasion, has provided the needed reality check and recently refused to approve the government's balance sheets unless capital budgeting were brought in. But it is not in the interests of the dominant revenue group that this be done for the reasons just outlined. Nor is it likely to occur so long as our economic theory remains focused on market theory dogma. One of the greatest threats to a nation-state's stability has to do with two issues concerning the banking system. First of all, deregulation has shifted the dominant revenue from financial profits acquired through interest to mere speculation, or if you like, out-and-out -out gambling. So that nowadays we see the collapse of large corporations suggesting that not only does the market subs subsystem not work, in isolation from other subsystems, but those who roll the dice in that game do so at the risk of their employees. Because of deregulation, banks can now engage in just about every aspect of the stock market, acquire brokerage houses, underwrite stock issues, design and peddle derivatives which are highly leveraged gambles on a particular aspect of a security. Such was not always the case. In the 1930s, banks were restricted in the interest they could pay depositors or charge borrowers, and they could have nothing to do with stock markets or insurance. But after the war, restrictions on interest rates were done away with. It was then made possible for the private banks to load up with government debt without having to put up any money of their own. This leads us to the second issue concerning banking the misuse of nation-state central banks. The very idea of a government that can create money for itself, allowing banks to create money that the government then borrows and pays interest on, is so preposterous that it staggers the imagination. The money creation function, how money is created and who creates it, is arguably the best kept secret of the 20th century. This issue is of such critical importance to democratic institutions and policymakers that Kummer made a one hour video of it, the predecessor to the program you are now watching. Here is a clip from that video. Money is created in two ways, through a nation's central bank and by the private banking system. Money is simply a medium of exchange. One can almost say it's created out of nothing, but not quite. Specifically, it is created out of a faith based on the credit of a nation. Otherwise, it would be worthless. The problem with having the private banks create 95% of our money is the burdensome interest payments, as our expenditures sheet illustrates. And just to be clear, these figures do not include the public debt interests on provincial or municipal debts. Our tax money goes towards such interest payments rather than towards more equitable tax refunds 
or the funding of federal and provincial social and infrastructure programs via transfer payments and otherwise. Well, clearly, the private banks should be creating less money. And this would cause them no harm, as they would still be making considerable profits. And national banks should be creating more money, which would be essentially interest-free at the federal level and available to lower levels of government, provincial and municipal governments, at interest rates well below private bank rates. Why do governments not utilize the powers of their own central banks on behalf of their citizens? Well, for the same reason that the economic model of the market subsystem persists. It is in the interests of dominant revenue stakeholders that this be so. Policymakers need to understand that private banks do need to be regulated and that their own central bank can be used to the benefit of all citizens and not just the select few. Let us give you an example of the intelligent use of the central bank. If at all feasible, most people would like to see a reduction in taxes and a reduction in the deficit. So let's see what we can do. Suppose we pick as our target the government treasury. In gross terms, the revenue and income of the Treasury determine whether it is balanced or in deficit or surplus. Our initial step will be to apply two measures of opposite effect on the Treasury. First, a reduction in the GST from, say, 7% to 4%. Secondly, let us shift a calculated proportion of federal debt from the private banks to the Bank of Canada, a step we discussed earlier in this section. Since the federal government is the single shareholder of the Bank of Canada, the interest paid on its bonds reverts to it substantially. Thus, the Bank of Canada can increase the federal bond holdings enough to balance the revenue lost to the FISC by the reduction of the GST. In other words, there need be no cry as to where the money is going to come from as no additional money would be necessary. We would then monitor the indirect effect of these two measures as they work their way through the economy. A lower end cost of consumers goods to the public by the reduction of the GST and a reduced interest expenditure by the government would certainly perk up the economy, so leading to further income for the Treasury. As this occurs, we could then move on to eliminating the remaining 3% GST. There is nothing complicated or confusing about this example. Moreover, it is an example which could act as a prototype for use in any area of our economy. In each case, with a calculated shift of federal debt from the private banking system to the central bank to offset somewhat, or even entirely, depending on negotiations between the various levels of government, the low interest costs of the projects being considered. Seeking out such usages could be an interesting challenge for an economist's ingenuity. In our next section, we will introduce a number of tools which could be of assistance to that end. With our deregulated and global economy becoming more unruly every day, there is an obvious need for a simple test to weed out in advance policies that cannot possibly fulfill the expectations pinned on them. Such a test does exist. In essence, it was taught to us in our high school algebra class. To solve equations with two variables, we learned that we needed two equations. 
Some years ago, Jan ten Bergen, a Dutch economist, translated this into economic terms. If n independent variables can be identified in a problem, no solution with less than n independent variables can possibly work. All economists have heard of the Tin Bergen counting rule, and yet, for some time now, the application of one blunt tool, high interest rates, beneficial to dominant revenue interests, has been used to bring price down, but only by collapsing the economy with unemployment. But even advocates of high interest policy recognize there are two variables here, as seen in their notion of the natural rate of unemployment, defined as enough unemployment to keep the price level flat. True, more unemployment will bring down price, but it will leave in its wake broken families, poverty, illiteracy, disease, crime, political unrest. This, as a solution, is incomplete and unacceptable. Where several quite distinct factors are contributing to the upward inching of the price level, the reigning theory sees but a single variable, too much demand. As a matter of fact, we see an action all around us. The discrepancy between the independent variables in the problem, more than one, and the proposed solution a so-called natural rate of unemployment. In fact, we have seen that there are multiple variables that determine price. Again, we return to price. What is price? Price is a market phenomenon, but as we see, non-market sectors become involved because they must hire staff and purchase their supplies on the market. It is this interplay of market and non-market sectors that makes our economy mixed. Economists and teachers of economics might consider that solutions to the economic interplay of forces in our modern economies require more than one blunt tool for resolution. The Tinbergen counting rule is a simple starting point for evaluating and identifying what those variables are be they operating in the public sector, the environment, the household economy, or elsewhere. We will now move on to look at another way such a ver variables may be identified. Every time a policy variable crosses a boundary into a different subsystem, its role changes. At all such crossings, the Tinbergen count begins anew. This brings us to scalars and vectors. A scalar has quantity but no direction. A vector has both quantity and direction. A vector performs according to where it is headed and where it has arrived. The product of a scalar and a vector is always a vector. The mass of a potato, for example, is scalar. When dropped, it is pulled towards the Earth's center of gravity. The scalar, the potato, is multiplied by the vector, the force of gravity. We discuss this because the official model of our economy deals essentially only with scalars. This leads to outright confusion between economic quantities and economic choices. Applying a scalar where a vector is appropriate is equivalent to believing that a dropped potato will not fall to the earth, but behave like a yo-yo returning to where it came from. Price levels, wages, employment, research and development, new industry, the environment, are all seen by official economic theory to behave in this same way. But they don't, and when they don't, interest rates are raised to reduce unemployment by another scalar, to squeeze the price level by yet another scalar, to an assumed equilibrium level which doesn't exist. By way of example, here is a simplified version of our mixed economy with just three subsystems, the market, the public sector, and the environment. We must keep track of the effect of whatever we do in the market on these other two sectors. 
Unless we do, we risk severely depleting their resources. This is indicated in the diagram by the arrow-headed vector lines running either way between all pairs of subsystems. The effect of market happenings on the other subsystems will echo back into the market. For example, should we overfish the grand banks, sooner or later the cod, a scaler, will disappear and throw thousands out of work, thus affecting both the market and the public sector leaving disastrous results for the federal finance minister to deal with. The point is, communication between different sectors of the economy can take place only through vectors. Direction. Because economists ignore vectors, there has been no adequate intercourse amongst the subsystems of our economy. Scalers and vectors are tools economists and academics could use as instruments to apply to quantities in our economy and to policy options. In both physics and the economy, scalars and vectors combine to form operators, indicators for those who determine policies. In essence, all of the subsystems of our economy need policy direction of some sort. Let us give you another example of what we mean by a vector's change of direction when crossing from one subsystem to another. The applause you hear is for the finance minister delivering a balanced budget. But for many years, these budgets have favored the market sector of the economy by allowing substantial interest payments to be made through our taxes to financial market forces rather than directing funds to other subsystems in our economy. When we cross into a different subsystem, it's a different story. In public sector health care, we see not only a lack of funding, but substantial cuts to hospitals, doctors, and nurses. As our health care system is abandoned, that is, allowed to deteriorate so that market sector forces can intervene for profit, such crises are likely to continue to occur. There is little to applaud here where human value is overruled by shareholder value. Such behavior in this, as in so many other instances, is irrational since healthcare crises will cost more than whatever imagined savings might be made by allowing the health care system to deteriorate in the first place. But market enthusiasts will argue that privatization is the solution, in spite of worldwide evidence to the contrary. Another tool which fits perfectly into systems theory and other control overviews is dimension analysis which, simply put, determines that bigger is not always better. Mergers of large corporations, media conglomerates, or globalizing banking interests take on a much different reality when assessed by dimension analysis. Globalization and deregulation were thrust upon the world without being carefully evaluated through just such testing. Transfers and counter-transfers of social and physical energies occur between various subsystems of our economy. As potential differences or negentropies are used up in doing work, entropy builds up. This could be a valuable analogy for helping us understand the changes in energy levels in subsystems. Modular congruence could be applied to economic problems as a way to sort out and refine situations and data which, in our mixed and complex economy, can easily become confusing and overwhelming. Keynes indirectly alluded to modular congruence by noting that we exchange cookies with Denmark. Wouldn't it make more sense to exchange recipes? 
These are but a sample of the tools economists could use, develop, and refine to tune and fine-tune our mixed economy. We would urge economists and academics to consider them. Conventional economists ignore them all. We have seen that reducing our mixed economy to directives through one blunt tool, high interest rates, is unworkable and destructive. High interest rates are a benefit only to a small, select proportion of our population. Interest is the revenue of those who lend money. Assigning to them a monopoly in the so-called fight against inflation, which is what we have done, is like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. In our next section we will see what happens when this is so. In excess of 35% of Canadian companies are now foreign-owned. No other G8 country has a statistic even remotely resembling this one. It is quite possible that, that in the near future Canada may disappear as a nation-state, be balkanized, or be so hollowed out by foreign ownership that Canadians will be little more than tenants in their own land. When a foreign company takes over ownership of a company in another country, management decisions, payroll, database, and research and development are all shifted to the foreign country. Further, through transfer pricing, all of the profits are shipped out of the country before taxation, thus reducing the donor country's tax base. Again, no other country in the world has, or would, allow this to happen. Industry Canada has estimated that more than $500 billion worth of investment has been made in Canada, but of that so-called investment, 96.4% has been solely for the takeover of companies with the transfer of control and profits taking place as just mentioned. Only 3.6% has been for actual investment in Canada. Since the free trade agreements, according to Investment Canada, as of October 2003, there have been 13,828 Canadian companies sold. You may check the, the Industry Canada website listed to verify this. That amounts to more than 60 companies per month over 18 years. As to Canada's access to the American market, as our chart shows, America is only some 6% foreign owned, and of that, Canada owns some 8%. Many people are not aware of the significance of the money creation function. As mentioned earlier, Kummer made a video about the subject, available through its website. Money may be created by a nation-state's central bank and by the private banking system. Currently, the private banking system creates some 95% of the money supply each year. Nor is this situation peculiar to Canada. It is a global phenomenon, part of the legacy of bank deregulation. The Canadian federal government could direct its own central bank on behalf of Canadians to create at the federal level and <coughs> spend debt-free and interest-free monies into circulation. Rather, it borrows as debt and at interest almost all of its monies from the private banks. This makes sense only from a dominant revenue perspective. We, as citizens, pay huge proportions of such debt through our taxes. 
How much is huge? The chart names this debt as the public debt interest and shows it is the largest expenditure. Thus, quote, reducing the debt, unquote, is merely code for using taxpayer dollars to pay the private banking system, an entitlement they did nothing to earn. We repeat a quote given earlier as it sums up the situation so well. The very idea of a government that can create money for itself, allowing banks to create money that the government then borrows and pays interest on, is so preposterous that it staggers the imagination. This ridiculous situation has done untold damage to the fabric of Canada and is, in fact, the most significant contributing factor to its internal erosion, depriving health care, education, environmental and social systems of much needed funding and leaving them in a shambles, all for the sake of making profits which, more and more, exit the country. The logic here is simple. Deprive health care, education, and infrastructure of federal funding so that they break down. Privatization may then be argued as the necessary solution. Most Canadians are not aware that Canada is being hollowed out, as we have said. Truly, it does seem preposterous. But that is because there is no open discussion or debate on either the extent of foreign ownership and what it means, or on how the banking system operates. The media are silent on these issues because, for lack of regulation, they have been allowed to consolidate. This should never have happened. Without independent media, there is no chance of seriously evaluating and debating so-called alternative information. On the contrary, such consolidation assures a careful selection of information, which will only serve to ratify certain policies. For example, Canadians may nowadays consider opening up the Canadian border, a customs union and common market, rather than retaining our own customs and market, lifting foreign ownership restrictions on transportation, telecommunications, and even the banks, merging our armed forces with American armed forces, adopting the U.S. dollar, or copying the U.S. health care system. Policies which not that long ago Canadian leaders would not have tolerated are in 2003 now considered feasible, even though poll after poll indicates the majority of Canadians do not want more so-called harmonization with the United States. But this is not considered newsworthy, and apparently the loss of in excess of 60 companies per month over 18 years, along with the attendant loss of revenue, is of no consequence, of little interest as a topic worthy of media investigation, as is also the case with any mention of the intelligent use of the Bank of Canada. There is a news blackout on these subjects. But Canada is not in decline according to dominant revenue interests. We recall our dominant revenue definition. During a specific period of development the dominant revenue is that one to which the others adapt themselves. It is presented as the revenue that, by the rate and mass which it achieves, determines whether the given economy functions properly. In the institutional framework corresponding to the given dominant revenue, that is, in fact, the case. But in another context, it would be otherwise. If, indeed, we set the context within any area of our economy, with the exception of the market subsystem, it is otherwise.
There are a few things that policymakers could do to bring our mixed economy into play. Governments need to get their own affairs in order through the implementation of capital budgeting. The private banking system needs to be re-regulated, their speculative activities curtailed, and statutory reserves reinstated. The Bank of Canada could be used intelligently for the benefit of all rather than only a select few. Independent public media need to be developed to encourage and not discourage debate. And a mindful eye must be kept on dominant revenue activities. Unless policymakers can come to understand in some fundamental way the nature of our mixed economy, we will be at the mercy of dominant revenue concerns. We have the tools, the capacity and the know-how to either build a better world or continue to degrade and destroy it. So we must locate national political leaders and policymakers who are willing to initiate real change on behalf of the citizens of the world. Only then will there be a place at the table for society. But not only policymakers, all of us urgently need to resituate ourselves and our worldview. We must come to recognize the critical importance of economics, the so-called dismal science. We need to understand that just societies can occur only through just economies. When and if we come to understand that, we will be well on our way to a better, healthier, saner world.